This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Search and recovery efforts continue in the Democratic Republic of Congo after a boat capsized in River Congo on Sunday. Russian Foreign Minister and U.S. Secretary of State discuss soaring tensions over Ukraine. And study suggests children in sub-Saharan Africa are dying of COVID-19 at a higher rate than other parts of the world. This is Africa Live. Hello and thank you for joining us. I am Penina Karibe. With me in studio is Uche with a sneak peek of what's coming up in business. Thanks, Penina. And here's a look at what's coming up on Africa Live. Today. A drop in egg production in Tunisia pushes prices up as much as 50%. And we look at how Nigerians are reacting to news of a pan-African payment system. Of course, all that coming up within the program for now. Back to you, Penina. Thank you, Uche. We begin the hour in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where reports say that search efforts are underway to find people believed to have been on board a ship that sank in the Congo River in the northwestern part of the country. According to survivors, the vessel was overloaded with about 600 passengers at the time of the accident. Joseph Bayoko Lokondo from a civil society group tells us more from Bandaka. We are very saddened by the news of the shipwreck with several dozen missing and loss of human life in the Bomongo territory on the Congo River, 105 kilometers from the city of Bandaka in Equator province. We have experienced this before. It is a recurrent situation in the province of Equator, and this is due to lack of public policy on the regulation of water transport in the province. The lack of means of transport that will allow the population to move around easily is also at the root of this situation. According to information from security along the river, we are told there were only two dead while the survivors tell us of several dozen missing. This is why we as civil society call for independent investigations so that the truth can be found on this affair. We also call for the care of the survivors who are deprived of what they had on board. We are calling for help for survivors to be repatriated or brought back to their respective families. We request the Congolese government to take measures to help people traveling from one point to another with easy traveling to avoid this kind of situation in the future. Let's get you more on this from CGTN's Chris Chamringa, who joins us live from Kinshasa. Chris, there seems to be conflicting reports about the number of those missing. What updates do you have on that incident? That's right. Uh, we haven't uh, got any official communication yet from authorities in Bandaka City, although one of the leaders there uh, issued a clarification. He said that they have found 180 people. Uh, p people who were rescued from that boat accident. Earlier in the day, we uh, reported that there were 180 missing. He said that's not correct. There were 180 people who were rescued. But uh, some of the locals, you know, are disputing these officials, uh, I mean, the records from uh, the, the leaders in that area. I earlier spoke to an eyewitness there who said he uh, saw 30 bodies uh, that were found uh, from that uh, Con the Congo River, the accident there. But the officials have not yet, uh, they haven't denied or confirmed this figure. So there's, there's still a lot of, of, of uh, uh, information that is not being given out. And that's because in the past, some of these officials in the provinces have been reprimanded by authorities in the capital here, Kinshasa, uh, for, for revealing some, some of these numbers, especially when there are very many people who have died in these accidents. So we are waiting. The search and rescue teams are still ongoing. We are waiting to hear from the government officials about the latest uh, toll uh, of, this, of this accident. Okay, so then there are reports, Chris, that this particular ship was carrying 600 passengers. Is there any confirmation about that number? How many people were on board? Well, 
Well, the River Commissioner of Mbandaka City declined to confirm or deny that number, although the witnesses, some of the people who survived this accident were saying there were more than 600 people. And so we have, you know, to just go with what uh, has been given by the authorities, the officials, that the people who were traveling on this boat were saying, confirming that there were more than 600 people and a number of people have called uh, also confirmed that figure. But then the government officials have not given us any any indication about the number of people. But what is for sure is that the DRC has had this problem. Uh, very many of these boats are in a very poor condition. They're very old and they're overloaded with passengers and cargo. And so it happens very often. Uh, accidents happen because of overloading. The officials in that area have, uh, you know, uh, warned the boat owners quite a number of times against uh, overloading these ships, but it hasn't been happening. Passengers have been allowed to travel without any life jackets, and when they drown, they, they die. It's a very sad situation in the DRC because there's a lack of enforcement here. The central government has promised to do much more, but it hasn't been done so far. All right, Chris, thank you for that update. Chris Achamringa live in Kinshasa. So let's head to Ghana now, and authorities there say they have embarked on a probe to investigate a massive blast involving a truck transporting explosives and a motorbike. The explosion that happened in a mining region in western Ghana killed at least 17 people, according to local police. The explosion happened after the truck and motorcycle collided, with, uh, collided in Apiate near the city of Bogoso. The truck carrying explosives was on its way to the Chirano gold mine owned by Toronto-based Kinros. The video posted on social media showed widespread damage to property. Ghanaian President Nana Kufuado in a tweet has described the incident as truly sad, unfortunate and tragic. Local police in a statement say most of the survivors have been rescued and taken to various hospitals. Police have appealed for calm, saying reinforcement have been deployed to the scene and people near the blast asked to move to nearby villages. Now, our Nabil Rafai is live for us in Accra for more on this. Nabil, footage from the scene shows almost an entire town leveled after explosives delivery truck crash. Can you tell us more about that incident? Well, uh, Penina, preliminary investigations by the police suggest that, I mean, this particular accident happened when the truckload uh, carrying explosives uh, was in, on its way to the uh, mining site in Apiate in the western region. Now, on its way, it actually collided with a motorcycle. Now, the impact of the collision, according to the police, ignited the explosives and uh, that's what led to the ex massive explosion that was experienced in that part of the country just yesterday. Uh, now, we are also told that just beside where the incident occurred, there was also an electricity mast that was also, I mean, affected by the blast. And uh, we are learning that about 500 homes have been destroyed as a result of this accident. Now, at the time the explosion occurred, uh, many of the people in that particular town uh, had gone to work or their farms and uh, school children are also left home for school. Uh, so um, a lot of people, I mean, uh, were not in that, uh, I mean, community when the explosion really happened. But then those who actually saw the initial blast uh, were rushing to the scene to uh, watch what had actually happened. And they were also caught up in the whole action when the explosives also, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, ignited and uh, the massive explosion really occurred, killing uh, at least uh, 17 people, uh, Penina. Okay, so we've had a statement from the local police saying that most of these survivors have been rescued. They've been taken to various hospitals. Uh, what, what kind of state are they in? Talk to us more about those that were injured. Yes, um, the police actually uh, in a statement said the injuries that have been sustained by the uh, 59 people are actually very severe and they've actually been sent to neighboring hospitals uh, within the region, um, within the uh, in, uh, town where the accident occurred. Now, because the entire community is now in rubble. Um, residents have actually uh, taken shelter in classrooms and uh, churches in neighboring communities after uh, this incident. Now we are learning that the those who have really sustained the severe injuries are being taken care of in their hospitals and the police are hoping that they will actually 
recover from uh, these injuries that they have sustained. But uh, the situation is that um, the injuries that have been sustained is actually very severe, Penina. Okay, Nabil, thank you for that. Nabil Rafai, live for us in Accra. In Liberia, there is three days of national mourning following the death of at least 29 people killed in a stampede at a Christian worship event known as a crusade. Attendees say Thursday's stampede started after a group of armed men rushed the crowd in an attempt to stage a robbery. President George Weir had earlier visited the scene of the crash in New Crew Town. He declared street gangs an increasing problem in Liberian cities in recent years. Chao Mgono tells us more. My sister and I were heading outside. As soon as we reached the gate, we saw big crowds of people. People were pushing each other, falling on others, and that's when we decided to go back. But we could not. They had already closed the gate. People started stepping on others, and I saw people dying. People were stepping on my back and my chest. I fainted only to wake up and find myself in hospital. I want to see her. I want them to show me she's there alive if I see her. I believe she's okay. This has been the situation since the stampede at a church in New Town in Liberia on Thursday. Families coming to identify bodies of their loved ones. Liberian President George Weah has ordered an investigation. One person has already been arrested. Bands of Liberian street gangs, known as Zogo, are believed to be behind Thursday's incident. Zogo Boys is a local term for young criminals. What really caused the people to start running was the men who were at the entrance. They were attacking the people that were leaving the service. When the service finished, there were people that were going home already. In the highly religious country of Liberia, where a majority of the population of 5 million is Christian, crusades are common. Accidents are also relatively common. A stampede at a similar prayer event in the center of the country in November 2021 killed two infants and hospitalized several others. Chao Mgono, CGTN. Let's head to Tonga, where the United Nations says 84,000 people, more than 80% of the population, have been badly affected by an undersea volcanic eruption and subsequent tsunami. The UN has called access to safe water Tonga's biggest life-saving issue. The natural disaster has destroyed all houses on Mango Island. Properties on the west coast, west coast of Tonga Tapu, the country's main island, are severely damaged. The UN, Australia and New Zealand are sending crucial aid and relief supplies. So the United Nations says 84,000 people, which is more than 80% of the population, has been badly affected by that eruption and the subsequent tsunami uh, in Tonga. Tongan Olympian Peter Taufa Tofua has raised over half a million dollars to deliver aid to his country. CGTN's so Nicole Ng sat down with him to ask what the people of Tonga need right now. So what we need probably the most is water, desalination, water filtration. Uh, you know, solar, electricity, um, food supplies, so basic, you know, flour, rice, that sort of thing, um, and, and equipment for PPE equipment. So things to help clean up a whole country that's covered in ash without everyone getting sick. So masks, for example. If anyone out there has, has spare uh, ventilators, you know, there's... Uh, Everyone's in Tonga is breathing ash, and um, if anyone is spare ventilators, so hospital hospital equipment as well. Right, and it must be a really difficult time right now to be away from your family, to be in Australia. Home must seem really far away. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm 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 feeling okay. I, I um, still haven't heard from, uh, still haven't heard about my father, but we're expecting news. Later today is kind of what the expectation is. Um, so the entire time you haven't just, uh, I mean, one, I mean, probably the biggest thing has been communication, uh, the communication lines, but also for some reason he just went, uh, went off any kind of anyone's radar. So we have to 
figure out what that is. I, I'm optimistic that he'll be uh, fine and he's out there working, but um, we haven't heard uh, directly from him just yet. And since that interview, there's been good news that Peter's father has been found safe and sound. He had traveled to Hapai to help with the first aid operation. And so Astonga is still reeling from devastation wrought by a volcanic eruption and tsunami last Saturday. Our reporter Sao Bing talked to Ann Kolkwan, the United Nations humanitarian official, on the damage of the country and support from the international community. How big are the challenges and do we have the report on the damage? Yes. Yeah. So Tonga is currently undertaking an initial damage assessment and we're anticipating the results of that. So far, um, we're aware that uh, most parts of the country, including remote and isolated islands, have been visited by Tongan assessment teams. We're also aware that all agriculture sectors, including crops, livestock and fisheries, have suffered substantially. So that affects well, approximately 1,200 households, no, sorry, 12,000 households. And we're also aware that the cleaning of ash continues. We're aware that the airport is now open. And we're also aware that at least five communities have been identified as having suffered significant damage um, to households in coastal areas. There are at least 31 houses completely damaged, 72 severely, 46 moderately and 23 minor. But that's a work in progress. We're still getting from UNISAT uh, the UN satellite, the uh, detailed images of, of the devastation. These are available online and uh, they're showing significant ash coverage across the, the islands. We're also aware that there's still very limited internet con connectivity, but this is improving. And I know that the Tongan government is working with the UN's International Telecommunications Unit and New Zealand and Australia and Digicel and other partners to improve connectivity because this is a, a critical communications tool. Currently, the international uh, community are also sending their condolences, of course, to the country, dispatching all those daily necessities onto the ground. What are your comments on that? It's great to see that the world community is standing by and ready to support Tonga. Yesterday, we had a coordination meeting with a range of donor partners around the region and many of them made pledges of support to Tonga that are absolutely significant. And I want to reflect also that China has given already $100,000 through the Chinese Red Cross Society and has flagged that it may provide more assistance based on need in Tonga. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken are in Geneva to discuss soaring tensions over Ukraine. Both sides struck a pessimistic tone as proceedings got underway. The talks come after a string of meetings over the last week failed to reach common ground. Uh, Russia has, ma has massed tens of thousands of troops on its borders with Ukraine, and Western states fear Moscow is planning to invade its neighbor. The Kremlin has denied this, but has indicated it could take unspecified military action if a list of demands given to the U.S. and NATO are not met. 18 minutes into the hour, this is Africa Live. Let's take a short break coming up. Study suggests children in sub-Saharan Africa are dying of COVID-19 at a higher rate than other parts of the world. People know me as Kano the footballer. Of course, we love them to know you as somebody who cares and yeah, yeah, who have come all out to help others and save lives. No mistake, order restored. You see yourself being fit and then uh, somebody came up to you and then said that you're not really okay, you have some problem. Africa is a continent of diversity, with varied climates and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent, to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa. 
as it shapes its own destiny. Africa Live. Find your voice. Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni has demanded better representation for Africa on the United Nations Security Council. Museveni was speaking at the ninth meeting of the African Union Committee of Heads of State and Government. Leon Senyange reports. Uganda's President says Africa needs adequate representation at the United Nations. Yoweri Museveni was speaking to foreign ministers from the African Union Committee of 10 Heads of State and Government, also known as the C10. The committee was set up by the AU to advocate for a stronger African presence on the UN Security Council. The Ugandan president demanded two permanent seats with veto rights for African countries. We demand our right of having permanent seats, not seasonal ones allotted to us by the president and fair system on the UN Security Council. Reforming the 15-member council is a debate that's been rumbling on for decades. Currently, the five permanent members are the United States, China, Russia, France, and the UK. The council's 10 other seats rotate among members who serve two-year terms. Gabon, Kenya, and Ghana are among the council's current non-permanent members. Leon Senyange. CGTN, Kampala, Uganda. South Sudan's armed group that broke away from the party of opposition leader turned Vice President Rick Machar have started arriving back in Juba. The group broke away last August and the two camps have been involved in clashes in the northern part of the country. But the breakaway group has now signed a peace pact with President Salva Kiir's governing party in Khartoum. CGTN's Patrick Oyet reports from South Sudan's capital, Juba. The fighting between forces of the opposition leader Riek Machar began in August last year and continued until last month. The splinter group is headed by General Simon Gatwech Dual, the former chief of general staff of Mr. Machar's forces. They are fighting in the northern part of the country in what is known as Upper Nile region, was threatening to derail the country's 2018 peace deal. But an agreement has now been reached aimed at ending the clashes. All of us, we have to put our hands together so that we can take this country where we actually want to take it. Because this is not the country that we wanted. It, we didn't want a country that full of wars. We wanted a peaceful country. And that didn't happen. Because we disagree. But now we have to come together. The opposition leader, Riek Machar, who is also South Sudan's vice president, has welcomed the peace deal. Mr. Machar has ordered his forces to cease any hostilities against the breakaway group. The Upper Nile is going to be very peaceful and everything will be okay. And our people who are refugees came in Sudan, they will definitely return back. They were very happy when they, when they heard that uh, we have signed a peace. The breakaway forces are now scheduled to join the government army. President Kiras issued an amnesty for the breakaway armed opposition group its government signed a peace deal with. While many here are welcoming the agreement, its critics say it sets out a bad precedent that might encourage other groups to break away from their main parties and seek for negotiations with the government which may derail the implementation of the country's 2018 peace deal. Patrick Oyet, CGTN, Juba, South Sudan. South Korea's President Moon Jae-in made his first official trip to Africa on Thursday. It was part of a Middle East tour that included the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Moon and Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi discussed expanding ties and witnessed the signature of four MOUs between the two countries. More with CGTN's Adel Mahri. President Moon Jae-in's visit was widely celebrated in Egypt. It's a rare visit by a South Korean president to the North African nation. Moon is the first South Korean president to come to Cairo in 16 years. This is a special visit as it is my first to Africa and Egypt as president of South Korea. 
Egypt is a central and pivotal country in the Middle East and Africa. It enjoys a rich history and has a geographical advantage as a connector between three continents. It has a wide variety of trade agreements that extends to many regions. Youth represents a great proportion of the population and there is abundance in natural resources. These are the resources for development. Economic ties between the two countries have been growing significantly in recent years. Both leaders discussed how to develop these relations further. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi and President Moon witnessed the signature of four memoranda of understanding in the fields of finance, transportation, cooperative development and information technology. Our discussions have also investigated the partnership opportunities between Egyptian corporations operating in Africa and Korean companies to promote investment in Africa, specifically in infrastructure. We've highlighted the great opportunities provided by the commencement of work in the continental free trade zone. Trade volume between Egypt and South Korea has been growing steadily to reach 2 billion US dollars in 2021. Korean investments in Egypt are a record $800 million from 33 companies, including electronic giants like LG and Samsung. The two countries are seeking deeper and wider cooperation in fields like renewable energy, space sciences, artificial intelligence and green economies. I believe this will enrich investment opportunities and ties between Egypt and South Korea. Both leaders are encouraging extending ties to include cultural exchange which will strengthen the social connectivity between them. Sisi and Moon discussed the possibility of establishing a branch of the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology in Egypt, a step that will significantly develop Egypt's technological capabilities. To remain an attractive option, Egypt promised to provide facilitations for South Korean companies and investors to come to Egypt. As for military cooperation, the two leaders have commended the efforts exerted in recent years to transfer technology and domesticize military production in Egypt. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. North Africa is one of the main regions of the Belt and Road Initiative. China had earlier signed MOUs with five North African countries, Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, Tunisia and Libya. While Morocco has been the first of these countries to sign a final implementation agreement this month, the others have been already active in their cooperation with China. Yasser Kim looks at the importance of the Belt and Road Initiative for Egypt. Egypt has been one of the first countries in Africa to sign up to the Belt and Road Initiative in 2016. The Egyptian president had made it clear that being a member is vital for the North African country. The initiative entails essential sectors that are priority in our plans to achieve Egypt's Vision 2030 for sustainable development, such as infrastructure projects in transport, energy and information technology. It also goes hand in hand with our priorities of stimulating economic growth, increasing manufacturing and raising bilateral trade and financial cooperation. The two sides had inked agreements for various Chinese projects on the Belt and Road Initiative. China and Egypt signed more than 30 MOUs in different sectors including health, education, transport, the electric train and more. Egypt is considered an important player. The initiative builds on the country's location to add value to the Silk Road. The Suez Canal, a main waterway linking the east with the west, makes the North African nation an attractive destination for Chinese businesses. The Suez Canal Development Project is based on establishing an industrial, trade and logistical center that provides promising opportunities for Chinese companies, the BRI members and countries worldwide to benefit from Egypt's strategic location to become a center of manufacturing and re-exporting products to the rest of the world. But going forward, Cairo is expecting more from China besides increasing bilateral trade and investments. Egypt wants technology transfer from China, as China is one of the most technologically developed countries in the world. We have skilled labor in a good location. So Egypt hopes the Chinese investments will bring with it a transfer of technology critical to development efforts. 
though Morocco is the first country in North Africa to sign a final implementation agreement with China on the Belt and Road Initiative, experts believe Egypt will follow suit later in the year to cement its ties with the Asian country. Yasser Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. And that is some worrying news. A groundbreaking study has revealed that children in sub-Saharan Africa are dying of COVID-19 at a higher rate than in the United States and Europe. The study, published in JAMA Pediatrics, was conducted in 25 hospital, hospital sites in six African countries between March and December 2020. Leader of the study, Professor Refilwe Masekela, says they are concerned that infants younger than one year had nearly five times the risk of death than adolescents since aged 15 to 19 years. The study examined outcomes in 469 children who ranged in age from 3 months to 19 years, with the average age being 5.9 years. A quarter of the children had pre-existing conditions. Earlier, we spoke to Professor Refilwe Masekela, who is the head of Department of Pediatrics and Child Health, the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, and she shared more about that report. Take a listen. Well, we think that there are a number of factors that may be accounting for this higher um, rate of death. Uh, firstly, um, we know that in, in Africa, there's a different spectrum of diseases in terms of morbidities. For example, uh, unlike in Europe and the US, uh, conditions like uh, HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, uh, diseases that we find in Africa and we don't find elsewhere. But also, I think more importantly, we think it's also related to the issue of access to healthcare facilities, uh, access to intensive care facilities, and advanced care, which some of these children would need if they have to go to healthcare facilities. We do know that there's a, a huge um, gap in terms of availability of things like oxygen, uh, critical care, and, and, and intensive care services. Uh, specifically for children, and uh, not having access to those services may be impacting um, the outcome of these children and some of them dying because they don't have access to that support and uh, advanced healthcare um, services in their, in, their, in, in their context. But we have the message here from, I think, the key message is if you have um, a child that has a um, comorbidity, that is, they have a chronic disease, they are at much higher risk of dying from COVID-19. And um, this would be really fitting into a public health message. What I think we, we have demonstrated is that um, uh, if, if people are at high risk, which is exactly what the study has shown, these would be the ones that should be targeted for vaccination and prevention of severe disease as well as death. So th that, that, that I think is the message from the study. You're watching Africa Live. Let's not cross over to Uche for the latest in business. Thanks, Penina. And coming up on Africa Live Biz. A drop in egg production in Tunisia pushes prices up as much as 50%. And we look at how Nigerians are reacting to news of a pan-African payment system. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. There's more to this place than just glorious landscapes. There's more to it than just, say, Table Mountain or glorious, endless salt flats. There's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest minds in the world. There is so much more to this place even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. It is the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home and the relentless drive to make it a better place that make it so special. And we know that because this too is home.
no one knows South Africa like we do. CGTN, see the difference. Africa Live, find your voice. Well, let's start off in Tunisia. The country is facing an unprecedented crisis in the production, distribution and inflation of table eggs. Now, in 2021, the production of eggs meant for consumption recorded a 5.5% drop compared to 2020. This is as prices increased by between 30 to 50% in some local markets. Yes, CGTN's Adnan Shaoshi with the details. Olfa Bouzid is a grocery shop manager in the suburbs of the capital city Tunis. She says that table eggs are either unavailable or very expensive. The purchasing power of consumers has been hit hard by the country's rising inflation. It is hard to get my usual stock of table eggs. There were so many successive tariff increases that groceries and consumers were disoriented. When I don't have eggs, people don't come to this small shop and it affects my daily revenue. Tunisia staple food is based on table eggs. I cannot afford to buy table eggs for my whole family. What are we supposed to eat if this important product is out of price? For several weeks now, the owners of small table egg production facilities have been rallying across Tunisia. The players say they are not able to shoulder the financial burden in an increasingly competitive industry. They are also decrying the rise in costs generated by feeding poultry. As small independent egg producers, we cannot compete with the commercial egg industry led by some industrialists who monopolize the whole market. Hundreds of small producers are facing big losses and going bankrupt while industrialists are taking over to control production costs and impose prices. The state must intervene before egg prices go up 100%. The Tunisian Consumer Organization says the nation's table egg supply will be affected this year if the Trade Department does not put in place new price control measures to regulate the market. The Trade Department has set the maximum profit margin so that consumers can buy eggs at an affordable price. The authorities cannot abandon small egg producers. Protecting independent small egg producers and consumers is a top priority. The Agriculture Department announced that Tunisia's monthly production of eggs for consumption amounts to 150 million table eggs, which represents 100% of the national production capacity. The Trade Ministry has urged egg producers to boost production in order to increase the strategic stock in the country. According to the National Observatory of Agriculture, the Trade Ministry has stepped up its control measures to deal with the persistent problem of speculation on table eggs, while the price of this product is theoretically capped. In December 2021 alone, 6.1 million eggs were seized by the economic control agents. Adnan Shawashi, CGTN, Tunis. Well, let's head to Nigeria now, where a court will hear Royal Dutch Shell's appeal to overturn an almost $2 billion award against the company for allegedly spilling oil in the Southern River State. Now, the energy giant is challenging a November 2020 judgment in favor of community members who claim that a leak from a company pipeline damaged their land and their waterways. Now, a federal court of appeal is scheduled to consider apl applications for both sides on January. January 25th. Farmers sued Shell and its joint venture partner, the state-owned Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, in January 2020. The award is much larger than any damages previously awarded by Nigerian courts to residents of the oil-producing region. Shell and the NNPC deny that spills occurred in the alleged dates, on the alleged dates rather, and say the claim against them is unsubstantiated, vague and exaggerated. 
Now, at the same time, Nigeria Securities and Exchange Commission is introducing a new rule that will expand the reach of authorities in monitoring financial links with suspected terrorist groups. The reg regulator has directed capital market players to screen and to verify every client before onboarding them and when carrying out one-off transactions. Operators will now need to ensure that clients aren't associated with any group designated as a terrorist organization in Nigeria or elsewhere. It also adds that operators are required to report all suspicious clients and transactions. The latest decision gives greater powers to the market regulator that will carry more sway with brokers and traders. And the Pan-African Payments and Settlement System platform was recently launched by the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. It is expected to boost intra-African trade and also save the continent about $5 billion annually. While CGTN's Deji Bademosi looks at how news of the initiative is being received in Nigeria. Isaac James runs a clothing store in a popular market in Lagos. Every other month, he travels to Togo for his supplies, but to do so, he has to deal with complicated currency conversion issues. Uh, we do sort out money from the black market, we buy dollar, and when we get to Togo, we convert it to the local currency, that is SEFA. Then we start our buying. Uh, it's a difficult process now because you have to go and sort out for money in black market. Most of the time, you not get money, so we take two or three days before we can get the volume of amount that we need. When we get to Togo, we also go and sell. Most of the time, if they don't have uh, available cash, we still to wait. Maybe stay like two, three days before we can be able to sort out our money and we we'll start our purchase. Experts say it's exactly these challenges that the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System is designed to address and make trading across borders seamless on a continent with several different currencies. So what it is going to do is to remove the recourse to foreign currencies like US dollars or, or, or euro for trading purposes. So a system would be adopted which would allow a seamless transfer of one currency to another within our basket of 40 currencies in, in, a, in Africa. So it removes all that costs and inconvenience and transaction costs and so many lengthy transactions. And uh, what it is 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 at the moment is confined to the Africa Free Trade Area, the 54 country members of, uh, of Africa Free Trade Area. For over two decades now, the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, has been trying to come up with a single currency for the region without success. The PAPS is expected to fill in the gap in the region until such a time when the idea of a single currency comes into fruition. We've nearly spent 30 years in ECOWAS trying to design a single currency. And we had 10 convergence, macroeconomic convergence criteria for the currency. So many countries were having problems meeting this criteria. So what has happened was that in ECOWAS we advised that should we just not go for a payment system, a settlement system, why waiting you know, forever for this um, a single currency. So, so while we are still debating this, then the, the free trade area arrived and um, Afrexim decided to, to, to run with it. Traders like James who have been battling the inconvenience and high cost of having to transact cross-border business through a third currency says he can't wait for the effective rollout of the payment system. So it's a very good development. It will enhance my business. It will make it to be more easier for me. I just go to Togo. I do my transaction with my customers. So if this one will work, if Nigeria can implement it, and ask the central bank to send memo to our bank so that we, they will inform our bank so it can be easy for us to know the exchange rates so that we can be able to do our business normally. The governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria has said the financial institutions under its jurisdiction will accept the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System and recommend it to businesses across the country. DG Bademosi, CGTN, Lagos.
moving on now, the Democratic Republic of Congo has moved closer to joining the East Africa community as negotiations continue on harmonizing tariffs. Now, Congolese authorities say they are looking forward to being admitted into the regional bloc in order to help boost uh, trade and investment opportunities with uh, member states. Well, here's CGTN's Chris Ochamringa with more from Kinshasa. Authorities from the East African community are hammering out details of the rules that the DRC will have to abide by once it's admitted into the regional bloc. The officials are discussing the harmonization of tariffs and taxes, which is a key step for admission of new members into the community. Last year, leaders from the Six Nation bloc endorsed the DRC's inclusion at a virtual summit. The DRC's Deputy Prime Minister, Christophe Lutundula, says the DRC is looking forward to increased trade and investment with the East African partner states. The DRC has an estimated population of 90 million people. It also has large deposits of mineral resources. But decades of political instability and corruption have left millions of its citizens living on poverty. The East African community are seeking to boost trade with the DRC. The team meeting in Nairobi is expected to conclude the negotiations next week. They will later submit a report to a council, which will in turn submit it to the heads of state of the regional bloc for their consideration. The process of admitting the DRC as the seventh member of the East African community is expected to be completed by March this year. Chris Sochamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. Meanwhile, in South Africa, the World Bank has now approved the government's request for $750 million to support efforts to offset the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Now, the loan was agreed almost two years after the National Treasury first approached the lender for help in financing a $33 billion relief package following the onset of the pandemic. The Treasury says the low interest loan will contribute towards addressing the financing gap stemming from additional spending in response to the crisis. It will also assist in addressing the immediate challenge of financing critical health and social safety net programs. Now, of course, South Africa's government has faced calls from civil society for increased welfare spending. A panel last month recommended that the country gradually implement a basic income grant. Well, that's all for now on Africa Live Biz. But coming up later on Global Business Africa, Nigeria's National Economic Council has recommended a substantial increase in the price of petrol in the country. If approved, the price of petrol will jump from about 40 US cents per litre to about $1 per litre. We'll bring you more on that top of the hour for now. Back to you, Penina. Thank you, Uche. You're watching Africa Live coming up in sports. Eight teams sent parking as the Africa Cup of Nations enters the business phase.